on here we have the question of the um, Mark Fisher, you have our Chief of Public Safety presentation and discussion of the proposal to arm you of our sworn officers. So, uh, I'm going to pass a couple of things around. You're uh, welcome to take them. Just uh, leave them sit there. A uh, copy of the proposal that we also have on our website and a copy of the frequently asked questions that we have on our website. The FAQ is probably quite a bit more detailed than um, I would get into here at this meeting. Um, as I said, both of these documents are on our website, which is publicsafety.edu at the University of Rochester, if anybody wants to check it out or research it a little bit further. But, um, I'll probably do just a, a quick summary of what we're uh, about and what we're uh, proposing, and then uh, leave it for questions if anybody has any. Um, about uh, six, six years, seven years ago, um, we became a fully sworn police officer department. Um, it's a little different than being police officers. The main difference is, is that um, our powers are jurisdiction limited property owned or controlled by the University of Rochester. Uh, essentially all the other powers, uh, powers of arrest, powers of taking the individual into custody, conducting investigations, uh, those powers are very similar to that of police officers. But again, it's jurisdiction limited to property owned or controlled by the University. Uh, about three years ago, we began a discussion um, regarding an, uh, arming a portion of our department. About uh, two-thirds of my department now are sworn. We have about 180 officers, uh, all told, within the department. Uh, as all of you know, I'm sure it's a very big uh, institution between the medical center, a couple of uh, children's hospital, cancer center, uh, River Campus, Eastman Complex. We also have officers assigned to Strong West and out of the Bright Health Clinic, which is uh, an ever-growing proposition. We do a lot of uh, opioid treatment uh, and counseling out there, and that's just a, a growing field, unfortunately. Um, we do cover a lot of area uh, that we patrol. So about two-thirds of my department is sworn. Uh, two years ago, uh, the university went through a conversation, uh, a lot of community meetings. I think I appeared at this group as well, uh, talking about the uh, arming of a portion of those sworn officers to patrol the campus. Uh, after a lengthy discussion within the community, we decided to go ahead and arm about 40 uh, sworn officers. Uh, I should mention that those officers go through the same basic academy that uh, Rochester City police officers go through. Um, we also do the same in-service training uh, when it comes to uh, the qualification that, that is required of an officer. So we assigned uh, various members of command staff uh, and all the way down to patrol officers, and those officers have been for two years uh, patrolling all throughout the medical center that includes the uh, Children's Hospital, the Cancer Center, um, and all the areas in Compass that you would see basically south of Elmwood Avenue. A few months ago, actually back in the spring, uh, after two years of armed authority, um, uh, I authored the proposal that you have in front of you, which would extend that armed coverage to the river campus and the eastern complex. Um, you'll see some of the reasoning behind the proposal for that, but a lot of it really boils down to um, timeliness of response. Um, the officers, we did some, you know, we just basically told the officers, tell us how long it would take you on any given uh, shift to respond to the River Campus, there was an incident involving a weapon or an incident involving an active violence situation, and it ran anywhere from four minutes up to 13 minutes. If an officer's in the top floor of the children's tower, uh, their response time is greatly delayed, and we, we don't have uh, a you know, huge number of officers working at any given time, and they're frequently engaged in uh, issues in our emergency department in other areas of the hospital. Um, it was kind of highlighted by an incident about uh, two months ago. There was, an, there was an individual who um, was at our Brooks Landing residence hall, first crossing residence hall, and he opened his coat and showed what appeared to be a firearm to an individual who was in the car. Uh, the individual called both 911 and public safety. And we had to send, because there was a, we're not armed on the campus, there was an officer that was sitting across the road in the parking lot um, at Brooks uh, Landing, and, and um, he turned his head essentially when the call came in. He saw the individual, uh, met the description, matched the description of the individual with the uh, gun in his waistband. Supervisors told him not to approach, and all he could do was sit there and observe. Uh, it appeared the individual was waiting for someone to exit the residence hall, uh, probably to commit a crime. Um, an officer across the river uh, who was unarmed also, of course, because he's on the uh, river campus, actually drove to the hospital, got out of his vehicle, ran into the hospital. 
uh, an armed officer ran out from the hospital, got in that car, and drove to the campus, and was able to take the individual into custody at about the same time that the Rochester Police Department uh, arrived on the scene as well. So um, the timeliness of response is a really big issue for us. Uh, we know that in an active violence situation, national statistics are that uh, a person is injured every 15 second, seconds and a person is injured or uh, killed every minute. Uh, the incidents usually run from five to seven minutes in duration. Uh, so the speed with which the officers can get on the scene is really critical in mitigating a situation like that. Um, time really counts in a situation like that. I know my department and I know the Rochester City Police Department also now train um, very differently than we used to. Um, I started my career with the state police about, well, I was a county um, But uh, at that time, really, the, when you had a situation where someone was in a building with a firearm, you set up a perimeter, you call negotiators, you call for a special weapons and tactics team, and you waited the individual out. Um, that kind of evolved into um, law enforcement to a team response where you know, four or six officers would you wait until four or six officers got to the scene, then you would go in in a formation and you would confront the uh, shooter. Uh, but with the, with the recent thing happening, uh, most departments are now moving toward a single officer response. So the officer who's on the scene or who's near the situation knows that he may have to and probably will have to respond alone because in a great percentage of those active violence situations, as soon as a, a law enforcement officer is on the scene, the situation ends. It either changes the individual's channel if he engages law enforcement or more frequently probably they commit suicide. So um, from a timeliness perspective, it's uh, really important for us to get officers on the scene of things very quickly. Uh, and, and the reality for us is, is that we have um, you know, a portion of our department is armed. Um, their office is on the river campus and they travel through the campus and they go to the medical center. So they're traveling back and forth uh, on the campus, but they can't get out of their vehicles. We had a situation uh, last summer where an individual threatened to kill a coworker um, in one of our buildings, uh, Wilson Commons building, and the lieutenant was, was on the scene. He was at headquarters doing some paperwork. He saw the individual walking down Wilson Boulevard and he couldn't approach the individual. He simply couldn't get out of his car because it's against the rules uh, for uh, someone to be armed and get out of their vehicle on the river campus. We had someone in the residence hall that overdosed on some pills uh, behind our headquarters at Wilson Boulevard. We had you know, a supervisor in the building, a sergeant, um, who was doing paperwork. He was an armed sergeant. He couldn't render aid uh, for the person that had overdosed because uh, he couldn't get out of, he couldn't respond to some area on the campus. So. Um, we're losing the usefulness of those officers. Uh, obviously, uh, leadership uh, for armed officers is really important. So I've armed the majority of my supervisors because I feel if there is a situation involving a firearm, it's really critically important that my bosses aren't sitting in the car while the younger officers go in and handle the situation. I want my supervisors to lead from the front. Um, so uh, most of the supervisors now being armed have lost the relationships that they used to have with uh, the campus community. Uh, because they can't attend meetings, they can't attend our major events like Meliora Weekend. Um, they can't function as part of the community because they can't re respond simply because they're armed. So um, we're seeing a loss of the relationships between my department, its leadership, and our community. So um, those are the, the big reasons for us uh, to have made this proposal. Uh, I think over two years now, uh, the officers have demonstrated that they can use this authority um, being armed responsibly. Uh, we've had very few situations where um, we've even had to unholster our firearms. Uh, but we do, unfortunately, have situations where individuals are in possession, possession of weapons. Uh, they do uh, come on our campus, and sometimes they're members of our community. So um, it's a big community. We have probably 25,000. 30,000, I think it's actually over 30,000 now employees, probably coming to answer that question. It is, it's over 30,000 now. Um, <laughs> and, you know, an untold number of visitors uh, come to our campus. We are the trauma one uh, medical services for about four or five counties. We're also emergency psychiatry uh, for about those same four or five counties. And we just have a very, very large uh, community, about 12,000 uh, individuals that are involved in undergraduate, graduate, doctoral studies. Um, about 130 different countries from around the world are represented within our student community. Um, at our Eastman School, um, at least on the river campus, we can send officers from the medical center to respond. That four to 12 minute response time is slow. At the Eastman community, we rely completely on the Rochester Police Department for a response. Uh, tremendous department, great working relationship with, with, 
police department, but um, they have priorities too. Um, and you know, the reality is they don't have access to some of our buildings. They don't uh, know the ins and outs. I don't know if anybody's ever been in the Eastman School of Music or in some of the uh, annex building. It's uh, it's a maze. Uh, it's really tough to find your way around. And having familiarity with knowing how to get someplace directly and quickly uh, with the access required, whether it's through a key or a card access, is really important to uh, responding to a situation that might involve a weapon or an equipment. So um, I think the time has come. Our department is a professional law enforcement agency now based on their training, uh, based on the training that we do internally with our department. We know our community. Um, we know the culture of our community. We really, um, you know, it's not like we respond to somebody else's house. We're responding to our own house when we go someplace within our campus because um, we work there every day. We build and develop strong relationships with the people that we work with um, and we respect um, the diversity and the culture of our community. So we really want to be the first responders to things that happen on our campus. We want to be able to handle all calls for service. Um, currently, we can't handle all calls for service uh, at the Eastman uh, facility or on the river campus because um, we can't respond to, to calls involving uh, weapons either at all at the Eastman or in a very delayed uh, response on the river campus. So um, I promise to keep it a little bit shorter. That's kind of the sum and substance of the reason I made this proposal. Um, be happy to take any questions if you have. I'm just curious if from the officers that have the guns now, can they back up the Rochester Police Department if there's an issue there? If they, if they were on campus, they could back up the Rochester Police Department. Um, they cannot leave the campus, no. however. <clears throat> so we do not go out into the neighborhoods. Um, we have established uh, a memorandum of understanding with the Rochester Police Department. Um, and in fact, not only do we not go out to campus, but we frequently ask the uh, police department to assist us with serious felony investigations. We just don't have some of the investigative resources. We don't really have the forensic capabilities that the police department does. So if there was an incident on campus and, and the police department responded, then I would expect our officers to work closely together and back each other up. And in fact, uh, Captain Mullen's Mull request about four years ago now, we did a joint exercise, uh, an active shooter exercise, Captain, and a subsequent exercise um, to get our officers to work together. Mm -hmm. Captain has a very aggressive program about getting his officers into to my bosses and to my officers and really to our campus. So uh, we would expect that they would back each other up on an incident on our campus. Off campus, police department's on the mm -hmm. <laughs> Thank you. So what is it that identified as the campus? Because some housing is, is on Plymouth Avenue. So I heard you say that, you know, that we, or maybe I read it here just quickly, that some of the officers, uh, armed officers or peace officers can uh, attend some of the situations that would be, you know, uh, or maybe on Plymouth Avenue. Let's just say Plymouth Avenue for one, uh, where some housing is. Is that part of the campus as well? The Riverview campus, that housing, and the Brooks uh, Crossing, um, residence hall, those are part of the University of Rochester property and that's the extent of where they can respond to any kind of housing on Plymouth Avenue. So that's in conjunction with your question as in campus that includes Plymouth Avenue and the Brooks Landing Brooks that's correct, area. Correct. They can respond across the street to any of the uh, you know we have a lot of student uh, students that live in housing across the street mm -hmm. and on the side streets they can't respond to any of those units. Right. They have no jurisdiction. As soon as uh, they step off the campus they have the same authority and police powers that you in fact, we're required to, we have to secure our, our firearms. Uh, we cannot take the firearms off the campus for any circumstances. But campus includes the housing on Plymouth Avenue mm -hmm. and at Brooks, so where it was. That's correct. Right. Mm -hmm. The area where the subway is, and I think there's some of our um, offices there in that longer building. That's, is that new of our, too? The property underneath those facilities is uh, owned by the University of Rochester, so technically we have jurisdiction there. We could respond, um, but what we do is um, we respond to the offices that the university has. If we had something happen in the subway, we did have an incident there um, involving a potential weapon, and the police department did respond as a primary agency. agency to that. We would have jurisdiction there because the property underneath technically is owned by the university. It's the same thing in College Town. <coughs> kind of share jurisdiction with the police department. Uh, frankly, if it's a relatively minor call, uh, you know, a trespasser or something like that, we're more likely to handle it. Um, 
it's more significant call than I would get <coughs> the police department to come again. But I don't mean to speak for you, Captain, but um, you know, we kind of share jurisdiction in College Town. Um, so, uh, yes, we would have jurisdiction on uh, that property. Mm -hmm. Is that the same for um, the State Bridge Hotel? Well, the State Bridge Hotel technically is on university property. Um, you know, I can't remember ever having a response to the State Bridge Hotel. Uh, I think if there was a complaint there, probably the police That's department That's on U of R property? The property underneath would be owned by the university. Um, so... You mean in the building or that space? The building itself would be owned by somebody different. Um, okay. That would be uh, owned by a private entity, and that would be the main reason why the police department would respond there. We really try to limit uh, our response to property that's that we're, we're occupying or that we're having office space in, and if we don't, then we would want the police department to be the primary responder to a place like that. Can you provide us with a map? I can. I mean, like, yeah. sort of fairly soon. So we have an idea because you're telling us, okay, Plymouth Avenue this, and then the stay bridge, no, but the property underneath it. So, you know, it's sort of a little confusing, especially for me, because as you know, I've had a few incidences with your security guards. I'm just saying. And, and the thing of it is, is that I attended some of the meetings when this was going on as far as arming the security guards. And I had a personal conversation with Joel Singleman before he left. And he, he told me, he even promised me. I said, do I have your word? And he said, yes. Now he did leave and he's gone, but he gave me his word that there would be no security guards that would be armed on the other side of the river. And that was my concern. No security guards armed on our side of the river. And a lot of that obviously has to do with the diversity that is our neighborhood, racial profiling, the, the training of or the lack of training of your security guards because of the incidences that involved me. So I'm just, I am very concerned that you want to arm your security guards on certain properties on our side. You know, yes, they can go here, but they can't go there. I mean, it's almost like we have the haves and the have-nots again. So. Well, it's all it's really very simple. It's just property that um, we have residents in or that we have business in. So you see a building that's occupied by university operation, um, we're going to respond there. If you see a residence hall that's occupied by students, then we're going to respond there. Um, you know, I would, uh, first of all, we don't have any armed security guards. None of the uh, armed officers are security guard status, they're all sworn peace officers. Um, so, you know, yeah. I would be happy to supply a map and I'd be happy to supply you with the training. Um, you mentioned the training. I would, I would hold our training up against any agency in this county. We not only do the basic training that all the police officers in this county regarding diversity and parent bias, we've created teams of uh, 10 officers on every shift who deal with mental health crises. Um, we're pretty uh, dialed into the concerns that impact our community and that police officers and peace officers generally do, and we train at a pretty high level. Um, you know, we're an academic institution, so education and training are really highly valued. I report to a public safety review board. Um, they review the actions of the officers. Um, they will mandate training. They will suggest training. Um, but I think that they're very happy with the training that we get to our officers uh, to keep them really up to speed on what uh, it needs to be in our community. And, you know, our community really is very different than uh, traditional law enforcement in the, in the respect that everyone who's coming to the university is coming for a reason, whether it's to learn, uh, whether it's to teach, uh, whether it's to uh, be healed or to heal. Uh, so we understand that people there have a different purpose. They have a really strong purpose and a really strong need to be there. If they're having a bad day, which a lot of people at the medical center, it's sometimes the worst day of their lives. They're either a patient um, or they're a family member of someone. And tensions can get very aggravated. So we spend a lot of time on de-escalation training. And you know, you know, unlike Rochester Police Department, who is just running from complaint to complaint to complaint, we really have time to spend 
you know, 15 minutes, a half an hour, an hour, two hours if we need to, working with family members, uh, getting them a separate room. So we really work very hard at de-escalation um, when it comes to the situations that we run into because we know people are there for a very important reason. But we're not so, talking, we're talking about this side. And the, the other, the one question I do have, how are your security guards uh, tested psychologically? Sworn I mean, police, police pardon officers. Pardon me? They're, They're sworn. sworn peace officers. How are they selected? I mean, what kind of testing do you do? What they, go, they go through uh, a secondary background check. So everybody who's hired goes through a background check, which is uh, very similar to a law enforcement background check with a criminal history check as well. If they get selected to go into the Army uh, situation, and really the selection for officers, um, basically what I do is I rely on all of my supervisors. I look at their personnel jackets. I look at their uh, work history. Um, I consult with um, all the leaders of my department. Um, and then I'll make a selection based on uh, all the officers who are sworn, along with my senior leadership team. Captain Reed is one of my senior leaders. Um, and then they go through a secondary background check, a criminal history update, if you will. And then they go to see a psychiatrist, the same psychiatrist. I'm not sure if it is the same psychiatrist anymore, but it's a, it's a law enforcement psychiatrist um, who does a full evaluation. So they'll spend about four hours um, in a computer terminal filling out a um, questionnaire. Uh, and then they'll go actually meet with a psychiatrist. And then he'll send me an evaluation back about whether they're uh, recommended for receiving the ARM status. And they'll go through two weeks of intensive training, um, the same that the police officers in the county do, which not only includes proficiency, in other words, you know, put holes in the paper, but then they also go through a prism course, which is probably for most of seen on TV, where you get a screen and it's a shoot, don't shoot situation. And they actually go into uh, live action, um, reality-based training, where they're going to enter a room and they're going to be confronted with a situation and using some munitions, which are projectiles that are fired that are not lethal, obviously, and they have to make a split-second decision. In every phase of that training, they have to pass. Um, and if they don't pass, then they don't finish the course and they don't become armed. And we have had people that couldn't complete some. What's the percentage? Uh, we, we've trained 40, uh, I think we're up to 46 now armed officers, and we've had uh, four people wash out. And that's, you know, that's probably a little higher than I expected, actually, because, you know, we have the luxury of selecting the cream of the crop of the department to become uh, armed officers, so... So uh, what's the racial bracket, the breakdown? The racial breakdown? Of, yeah, know, I mean, how many are white, how many are black, how many... I don't know. The department is right around uh, about 28 to 30 percent diverse. Are, I mean, in the last year, we just put this together for my boss. In the last year, we fired... Uh, 34 people, and, or 32 people, and 14 of the officers that have been hired are from underrepresented minority uh, groups. So diversity is very important to uh, the department. It's been very important to the university. Um, I like to think that we walk the walk instead of talk the talk. Um, I have Captain Reed and Captain City Coast on my senior leadership team. They report to me on matters of diversity directly. Um, we not only promote within our department and try to develop uh, leadership, but we also hire uh, very diverse uh, classes of new officers into our department to increase the diversity of our department. You know, our university, um, I think we're probably at or a little higher than uh, the racial breakdown of the university. Um, the group that I'm in, the reports to the CFO, we're, we're the highest group uh, at the university when it comes to diverse workforce. So uh, it's pretty important to our group. I understand fully that I have to represent my community if I'm going to have a group. How many women? I should have looked those numbers up. We have a there's a, a large number of women in our department. I think uh, I think the department um, attracts um, you know, a lot of uh, female candidates because of the nature of the work and the uh, officers really enjoy working in the medical center and uh, campus as well. Uh, the retention is pretty good for our department. Um, it's hard to compete against the public salaries and public pensions, but um, I think a lot of officers when they come there um, they make a career and we serve the in so. Mm. We have a diverse group of officers. I can send, I'd be happy to send the numbers over okay. along for that. I'm going to give you an email from somebody. So I had a couple of okay. questions. Um, well, one, I keep hearing our community, as you know your community. Right. Thank and you. how well Thank you know you. the community on the other side of the river because there's no relationship there. Okay. 
and that hasn't been built over the years. The bridge has come over, but we really haven't seen that relationship. You know, I've heard folks ask for things, but they haven't received it. You know what I mean? So I'm saying is there's a relationship that you have with the, um, on your community, what you're building, and that's what I keep hearing, but I'm not hearing what you have done on the other side of the river to build a relationship. So there are folks who wouldn't stand against, you know, the possibility of guns coming across. You've got an ad hoc committee, and I'm Zola Brown, president of 19th Ward. You have an ad hoc committee set up, you know, um, you're going around talking to folks as re they request. You know, so um, so it's look like you're building the stages, you know, in which do you have to go in front of the city council again. And the question is, and correct me if I'm wrong, is that if you have to go in the city council again, what has changed from the last time you asked for this proposal? From this time, because I keep hearing how you built your community, but I don't see uh, this on the other side of the river. And the last one is that the officers, they normally come here to the meetings? No. No. Okay. So are they here to uh, in the support of you for the um, proposal? Or are they just here to get questions and answered because if we have questions? Questions and answers. Okay. All right. That was a mouthful, but you can handle it. <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, I think there's probably some larger uh, questions in your questions about relationships across the river from the entire university perspective. Um, we aren't talking about policing any area except University of Rochester community. So none of what um, we're talking about is going to go into the adjoining neighborhood or the community. Well, we get that part. But you, you're missing the concern of we come across the river and putting guns on the side of which our um, black and brown children walk all the time and mm -hmm. issues that are around the country yes. and what could possibly happen. So that's why she asked a question about psychological. That's why I asked a question about women, the ratio, all of that, because that matters. And the university has not done a great job of dealing with the issues around diversity or, um, you know, um, racial equality. See, I just think that, you know, that's why people are concerned. So I'm glad this meeting is happening and people should ask their questions, you know what I mean, because it's important, you know, to get your questions out there because no one wants to be standing on the bridge, you know, and another year or whatever it is it takes uh, for you to get your proposal together and the ad hoc committee and standing against you. And, and the reason that people stand right now, probably because this really not has been a relationship with, you know, and that's important, you know, to have, you know, and some people may feel differently than I do, you know what I mean? And I know there was a letter that was sent to the, um, you know, the president with concerns, you know, and um, the ad hoc committee was part of that, you know, but I just want to see the relationship there because I'm here in community. You know, yeah, I, you know uh, when I'm talking about the university community, when I talk about and I'm talking about the knowledge of the community that's uh, surrounding the University of Rochester, please don't mistake me, I, you know, I, I work at the University of Rochester and the, my charge is to protect the University of Rochester okay. community to be able to respond uh, as quickly and as appropriately as I can to the situation involving anything that occurs on our property. So you asked what has changed. Uh, the only thing that's different in this What's different in this proposal from two years ago is that we're now in our department. We now have armed officers deployed to the medical center. What we're asking to do is to extend that area to cover the entire uh, campus and the eastern community so that we can... But wasn't that in a proposal before? Did you ask to be armed across the we river? We initially proposed this. We mm -hmm. looked to be armed throughout the university community. Right. After and a I'm sure you heard that. Okay. I'm sure you heard their concerns and they said no. Oh, so what has right. changed to make yeah. it better? So that you feel as though this will happen this time, things will work out. Right. What's different? In, in this in the proposal and in some of the FAQs, okay. um, they're, they're, we're not talking about any jump in crime or you know some kind of crime spree or something like that that's going on. It's just that right now, um, since that decision was made, we do not have the ability to protect our community. Um, the hospital and the medical center are receiving a higher level of service from our department than the River Campus or the East. We are not able to service both communities, communities equally and respond in kind in both communities. So if there's an emergency on the campus involving a firearm or an emergency at the Eastman uh, community involving a firearm or a weapon, I do not have the ability to handle those complaints with the current deployment of those officers as well as I could if they were deployed on those campuses. So from a law enforcement perspective, I feel like I'm letting my community down because I either have to rely on an 
outside agency to respond, or I have to hope that I can get there in time to handle the situation, and I don't really want to hope. Uh, I want to be able to do my job to protect the community as best I can. So we don't know your campus. I mean, I mean, you assume that we know what you're talking about. I don't know what you're talking about. What is your campus? Uh, anything is on the east side of the river and that housing that just went up on, on um, Plymouth Avenue that got switched up, but then they fought and got it back right. So I don't know what your campus is, okay? Maybe you got uh, uh, something over there in, uh, next to the walk, you know, where they do how high hiring. I don't, we, we don't know what it is. So I heard you hear say Eastman, where's Eastman? So, um, so Elizabeth asked that, and he said he would furnish him that, and I'm glad to pass that on and can be shared. Yeah, well, you know, so so that 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 that, that needs to be at the forefront, right, in a discussion, right? So I mean, I don't, so I don't know all of uh, what, what we're doing here today. There's some new faces. If they have some issues they want to bring up, I don't know what's happening today. But all I know is I don't know what we're talking about. <laughs> <laughs> So I, I think one of the, well, I had a, one question about when you say that you, you have the ability of your supervisors to look within, within where? Where are you getting your people exactly from? You were saying it's all, all it's all good because you, yeah. you know? No, everybody who in our department who is armed is a veteran of the department. So um, everyone who's hired is hired as a public safety officer. And then we select from that group mm -hmm. a group of officers to become sworn officers, but unarmed. Oh, okay. And then from that group, we further select after uh, time in, in service uh, to become armed officers. So okay. we have a trifurcated department. That's very helpful. The other thing is, when we're talking about what's changed, and I know Brian Potter over at Staybridge is trying to do this, is to build, get the students into the community as far as really, really having a connection. But it would seem to me if there were more of um, effort to build a bridge with the community, you would also have the community on your side when it comes to someone shouldn't be hanging out in front of Brooks Crossing. We as the community, if I'm sitting in Brew and I see something like that, we as a community should be part of policing the neighborhood. And so what I'm saying is there doesn't appear to be a very strong friendship between us where we got your back, you know? and when you're talking about arming that's not having our back you know so uh, just trying to figure out how can you step up your connection i mean real connection to the community where we're at the same table your discussions dealt primarily with an armed first response should we talk about the mental health first response you can do Right. Our, all of our officers are trained in de-escalation and recognizing and responding to mental health crisis situations. Uh, they get some of the best training uh, ever, I think, because they all start their careers working in the emergency department and psychiatry. So they work with some of the leading professionals in the field just merely by being uh, a part of the team responses that we have to psychiatric issues throughout all of the psychiatric uh, care areas that we have. Uh, but then further, um, we take 40 officers from our department 30 temper shifts with 30 officers and supervisors. We gave them a week of advanced training uh, for crisis intervention. Uh, so those officers received both in internal um, expert, but also experts from the community as well, came in and taught various blocks of uh, how to respond to mental health crisis situations to that specialized team. So they're in and amongst the ranks. They're working every shift. Um, but I would, I would suggest to you that every officer really in our department is maybe not an expert, that's probably a little overstated, but they have a, a lot of experience in dealing with mental health situations simply by the nature of the areas in which they work. 
I'd like to go back to the uh, episode where your officer was not able to aid someone who was overdosing. How did how does that happen? Oh, well, overdosing. Uh, what's, yeah, what's the what's officer mm -hmm. who's mm -hmm. sergeant? Uh, she's an arm sergeant. He was sick That's call. it. Uh, local bull, uh, our headquarters. Call came in for a student who had overdosed. Um, he was in Hillport, right behind our building. Uh, he could not respond to render aid to that student because he was armed. Uh, the officers who are armed are prohibited from going on the campus. We made a minor adjustment to that uh, to allow supervisors only in emergency situations can now respond to the campus after that incident, actually, uh, but the officers still do. So um, the person who was in the building had overdosed, um, and the sergeant couldn't leave the building to go right away. So who, whose rule is that, and, and who puts that's that in? University, that's a university stipulation okay. that was put in place when the armed officers officer could respond. The parameter at the time was no armed officer could respond in any situation on the river campus or the easement unless it involved um, the use of a weapon or the possession or use of a firearm. And is the university now changing these policies? The, univer the university allowed uh, a minor exception for supervisors to respond to emergency situations only um, even if they're armed. So We've now avoided the situation where someone could be, you know, suicidal or, uh, you know, uh, in a life-threatening situation, and my supervisor can't leave the building to go right their aid. The supervisor is only to respond to those situations. So or or, or, asking, or unarmed officers. Oh, okay, yeah, absolutely. Unarmed so officers. Are you, are you, case you where there was an limiting your ability to respond? Was that more? Are, are you going to be accidentally limiting your ability to respond to things like that if you add more armed officers? We're not adding more armed officers. Or what we're asking shift. for is the coverage area for those armed officers to expand to the entire okay. university. All right. the, the officers that are currently deployed will be the same officers that this would impact. Mm -hmm. uh, I have two questions. Can you clarify the difference between a public safety uh, officer and a sworn officer? A public safety officer is essentially um, a security guard status officer uh, under New York State law. Um, the kind of the first entry level person is a security guard status. They really don't have any greater authority than, than you do as uh, powers of arrest. Um, they do have some enhanced authority because they're custodians of the uh, university. Um, so very limited powers. They don't have the ability to arrest. They don't have the ability to take anybody into custody. Um, but when they become a sworn peace officer, they go through uh, a basic academy and certified by the New York State Department of Criminal Justice Services. Um, and they, then they do get those powers that most police officers have, which is the ability to take people into custody, to make arrests, to charge crimes, uh, to, to do those kinds of things. Same powers, but again, jurisdiction limited to the property owned by the university. My other question was if um, evaluating this expansion of that the armed officers can operate in. If they're, you know, turned to be for like the university, a lot of resistance, say, against our, you know, the, the river campus and, you know, Brooks Landing area being armed, would you consider, um, you know, Eastman as a, as, a, as a separate issue and then allow perhaps further further discussion about enhancing into the river campus as it does seem to be a bit, of a, a bit more of a hot button issue than, than Eastman does? It is completely out of my hands. It was, <laughs> I don't have any decision-making ability in this, so um, the president has formed an ad hoc committee of about 15 to 20 members. They're going to make a recommendation to the Public Safety Review Board. Um, we'll then make a recommendation to the president. We'll then make a decision. That's how we get things. Um, so there's a lot of there's a lot of things, a lot of uh, opportunity for input, uh, and a lot of opportunity for adjusting. I would, I would tell you probably there's nothing on the table. Um, they can make any decision. The president can make any ultimate decision um, that, that he chose to make regarding any deployment of any further armed officers. None all the way up to a full um, satisfaction of the I'm sorry, I missed when he, when he said what the one police officer can do. Did you say they can make arrests? The sworn officers can make arrests. Can make arrests. Yeah, what we, one of the things that we found that was happening with the security guard status is um, we would find students that were intoxicated, um, that were uh, in dire need of medical help. Um, if they were conscious and refusing to get the medical help, um, we had to rely on Rochester to come over and make the arrest to get them to the hospital. Now, 
lot of those things happen on Friday and Saturday nights. You can imagine how busy Rochester is on Friday and Saturday nights. So um, it really was an important life-saving uh, authority for us to have to be able to take those actions uh, on behalf of the community. And, you know, we've had plenty of situations where individuals have committed crimes. Uh, we had a lieutenant that was slashed by a box cutter a few years before we became sworn uh, because he couldn't take someone into custody. We couldn't use handcuffs and the individual just pulled the box cutter and thought we would have fled. So um, it's really um, enhanced the safety of the community, enhanced the safety of the officers, and have the ability to deal with situations. But again, um, we don't make a lot of arrests. Um, you know, most of the things that we do are settling situations down, de-escalating situations, um, and when it involves the students, a lot of times we refer to the dean's office, um, you know, they're 18 to 22 year old individuals, and uh, it's better to have the dean's office handle them than the clock up the court system. So um, a lot of our things are referrals. <laughs> the police officers here. Do you guys have input? So, I'm the section captain that covers this area, Tennessee section. Uh, I've been in charge uh, since this Army process happened. Um, I, I respect everything that's been sent here. I'm looking at a logistics. Uh, the stuff, if they can handle more on campus, that frees up my police officers to work your neighborhoods more. Um, so we only have a finite amount of officers. Um, we know the city fiscal situation, we're not going to hire another 50 officers. So I have what I have. Um, if, he, if, if, it, if his staff can handle some of these problems with his student population or medical campus, that, that, that's, a, that's a win for us because, again, that means I only have one officer working the other side, the west, uh, the east side of the river. Um, that's the 263 car beat. So occasionally it's a two car response, but. Um, so if, if it's a priority, we're pulling cars from this side of the river. And we've trained side by side. I, I think if you think of the public safety as a second rate organization, it's not. They are doing the same training equal to or above what we're doing. Um, again, we're on the firing line, shooting at targets, um, police officer, public safety officer. Um, so we're trying to get, a, to get to to get to know each other even better because we will be responding to some of these armed jobs uh, together. So that, that's that's how I look at it. Okay. And I see it as a, as a win in terms of manpower situation. Um, about how often do you <clears throat> find yourselves, oh, not over there as much as um, at the Plymouth uh, location or the Brooks Crossing location? So again, we don't go into their dorms usually uh, unless there's a weapons call or something that escalates it to something that we would respond because they can't. But they would be there right, by, right beside us anyway because they have access cards to get us into the building and get us to the location. Um, How often has that happened that you've needed to do that? I, I don't have records for that. Okay. Um, it would be a deep dive into some data that would not be readily available um, because mm -hmm. the data is broken down by car beat. Um, we could try to do an address run, but it, it might not be accurate. Uh, so most of the time, it's nuisance calls that they handle alone, but there have been a couple times where suspects in thefts or robberies were reported to have gone back there, and it would be a joint response. So it, it does happen, but I don't have a number for it. Does the university have that information? How many times? I mean, we have two incidents that happen on our side of the river on, on, out of these 10 that are listed. What I want to know is how many more incidents are there that you would, you would be responding to on the west side of the river? Um, do you mean incidents where, we, where a firearm would be necessary? No, not a firearm, but just like how, how, much, how much time are your officers responding to incidents? Not very often. I mean, really, um, when we do respond, it's mostly to the residence halls. A lot of it's 
door openings, college students even forget their keys, which is a lot. Um, so that as the captain was saying, a lot of the calls are to get a nuisance call um, like that. Um, and, you know, we don't have too many issues Friday and Saturday night. Uh, and Captain Green works those hours. He can probably tell you it's a little different. Um, you know, it seems to be the pathway to the neighborhoods where there are parties going on, so there's some more, there's a few more intoxication type calls. Um, university students are generally not fighters, so we don't get hardly any fight calls, but um, we do deal with intoxicated students and um, issues like that. Um, Captain, I don't know if you want Really, you know, they're upper class residence halls, and usually by the time they reach the junior and senior years, uh, they settle down pretty significantly and handle things a little more maturely, so we don't really have a lot of activity on um, this side of the river in those residence halls. And, you know, it's HR buildings that um, inhabit uh, the Brooks Landing area, so there's very few calls for service. I understand that um, the Brooks Landing area is that there's been a change so that you all can respond on sidewalks and streets. How about the walking, biking path in back of that residence hall? Is that also going to be your turn? That would be city property. Um, so I don't believe that that would be your It doesn't count as a sidewalk adjacent to I don't think it's adjacent to our property. Uh, the property would be adjacent. I'd have to ask a lawyer the question to be honest with you. We don't control the bike path. Just like we don't control the streets, so Seems I don't like think we would have jurisdiction there. There's almost more sidewalk and street adjacent to all of your properties on our side of the river than there is real estate. There's streets and sidewalks yes, all around yep. there. Um, I personally don't particularly fear this, but. I have a sense that compared to the size of your campus over there, to have an extra armed person and your fairly small sidewalk frontage for what's contained in it, it's kind of small property over here and the same number of increase in like, guns, it, it just feels like it's bigger over here. Yeah, I mean, the proposal is really geographically um, recognizing that our officers have a uh, lengthy response time to respond to something either if they're coming from the west side of the river to the east side or vice versa. Right, so right, just um, it's just really about response times. Now we may in fact find that the deployment model uh, has to look different uh, after if it was approved and we had to do something differently. Uh, but really the, it's the response time issue that really causes me. Um, I mean I don't lie awake at night but it does trouble me. Um, you know, I, I do worry about how long it takes our officers to handle calls like that. So that's why the proposal is out like that. We have one officer in addition to each week, um, just so that they can handle the situation involving the weapon and without relying on outside law enforcement. Thank you. Um, Captain, is so you're here, so obviously you would like to be from the community. Where would people write letters? Yeah, yeah. You can't go wrong writing a letter to the president. Um, you know, I think he has formed the ad hoc committee, so if you address something to... Uh, so we would send them to him and that yeah. Did you just say he? Yes. Isn't uh, it a she? No. It's going to be. It's Rich Feldman right now. <laughs> yeah. uh, Rich, Rich Feldman. Okay. Richard Feldman is the president currently. Uh, <laughs> I, you know, I think the ad hoc committee is probably going to establish an email address um, that people can send in their opinions. I, I don't believe they've done it yet. Uh, at this point, but if you send something to President Feldman, they will definitely get, um, well, he's the ultimate decision maker, so I think that's probably the uh, best way to influence if you want to influence someone. Um, it'll probably get to the ad hoc, I'm sure it will get to the ad hoc committee and the public safety review board. Um, but if you send it to the President's office, um, that would be, I think, the most productive thing to do. Mm -hmm. One to kind of go back to the terms of safety officers. So if the campus says yes, the campus says yes, um, how would you go about hiring additional officers? Uh, and then for the 
those officers, those same officers, some of those officers are going to be able to control um, those kind of things. How we, would there be an increase in the number of armed officers when it comes to overall? Um, you know, we, we're talking about three different positions. Generally, we talk about a 24 hour a day, seven day a week position. We talk about needing five people to cover that position. We're at a point now where we probably would not need to hire or train 15 additional officers. Um, we, could, we could make the adjustment for the current uh, armed staff that we have. Officers, because um, you know that additional post coverage is going to require it. I don't wouldn't know the exact number right now. It certainly wouldn't be more than 15. It would likely be less. And the way we would deploy them is um, what we currently do, which is on the river campus we have officers assigned to a mobile unit, to a patrol car. Um, so the officer assigned to a patrol car would simply be an armed officer. Um, and the same thing in across the river, we would have we have a mobile unit always assigned across the river. And the mobile unit would now contain an armed. Second and last, because um, I always, you know, I always see um, our officers uh, patrolling a uh, Riverview and a uh, Brooks Landing. Um, how often, like, do they have a regular rotation? Um, they cover it. Yeah, they they don't really have a regular rotation. They're they're tasked with um, floating between the. Uh, Crossings area, uh, responding to any call for service. Um, you know, when the, when the folks are coming in and going home, they like to have a high, high visibility presence in the parking lots and just be seen out there. But they don't have any set patrol um, that's um, mandated to the officers. It's really based on what they're seeing uh, in their travels. They can be seen in each one of the different areas throughout their tour multiple times. And so, I mean, we wouldn't necessarily change that. We wouldn't change that at all. You wouldn't see any change in any of our patrol protocols. It would simply be that there would be an armed officer doing the same current jobs that they're doing right now. Um, it would be the same veteran officers that have been part of the department for years uh, and have gone through the security guard status to the sworn status to the armed status. So uh, it's not like we're bringing uh, new hires in and training them in army and putting them out. It's the veteran officers that have been members of the department for, uh, in most cases, several years. I see you have our badges, but on it, what does that signify? I'm special. I know that, but I mean, <laughs> the, the different color codes, like yellow is for nursing uh, facilities, I think it's, it's, uh, it's just brown. Uh, the red just means that I have, I have kind of an all-access pass. Uh, this, this ID can get me into most places. Okay. Uh, you know, it's the nature of my job, having to respond to emergencies, I do need that kind of access. Okay. Mine is plain, so I'll just <laughs> <laughs> At the Riverview Student Housing Departments there, there is a, a building that I believe has your public safety officer there. Is the public safety officer there able to do an opioid response? Yes, all of our officers are carrying Narcan now. Uh, so, yeah, uh, it's actually been in place now for over two years and we've been carrying Narcan. Um, and we recently installed Narcan <coughs> and uh, mass casualty or trauma between kids and all of our ADD cabinets. So anywhere you're on the campus, if you see an ADD cabinet, there's going to be a Narcan unit inside the cabinet along with a, a bleed kit to stop, um, you know, like a, it's a tourniquet, but it's also a compressor you can put on a visual. Uh, that's one of the physicians in the medical center, that's his initiative. Um, we sponsored that and made that happen, and then our can was something that we sponsored because we just think it's the right thing to do. And people told us that they'd be stealing them out of the cabinets and we'd never keep them in there, but it's not happening. If there were to be a civilian having an opioid incident on the Plymouth Avenue area, in proximity to Riverview student housing, could a, a, a peace officer, uh, um, uh, one of the personnel, assist uh, a civilian? They met. I would be my very high expectation that if they saw a medical emergency, that they could go through their assistance. All right, so we're coming to a close on uh, <laughs> your time allotted. We've got to keep it moving. Uh, um, so, <laughs> any final comments or questions? Yes, ma'am. I would just like to uh, thank Captain McMillan. He has retired at the end of this month. Yes. Yeah.
talk to all of you. My replacement is uh, better than I, so I will be forgotten very fast. <laughs> Don't forget to tell him about all of us. He's already met some of us. Yes. <laughs> all right, thank you for coming, Mr. Fisher. Thank you. Have a good night.